Hello, my name is Mark Taylor and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place for creative and inspiring learning from around the world. Listen to teachers, parents and mentors share how they are supporting children to live their best authentic life and are proving to be a guiding light to us all. Hello and welcome back to the Education on Fire podcast. Thank you so much for joining us again. This is a bonus episode. In recent weeks, we've been repurposing some of the interviews I did on learning on fire and bringing them to you so that you get a chance to, to hear the great conversations that we had. And the Learning on Fire podcast was based around 10 questions. And one of the most interesting questions that we were asking was what was the best piece of advice you'd ever been given? Now, the episode that we're using today as a bonus was a compilation from my first nine guests explaining exactly what their answers were to that. If you want to listen to the entire episodes of these interviews, you can do that on the show page of this particular episode. If you go to educationonfire.com forward slash 148, that'll take you straight there and all those episodes will be available for you to listen to in one place. So I hope you enjoy this. This is what was the best piece of advice you've ever been given. There comes a time in every person's life when you realise it's not about doing what you are told, but doing what you know is right for you. Let us take a journey of learning and discovery with the world's most successful people who are living the life of their dreams, walking through life using their inner wisdom and being of service to others. Forget exams, grades and test scores. What is your purpose? As we let go of what we think should be and learn from our elders to gain knowledge, inspiration and a true sense of who we are. What are your dreams? Does your life have meaning? Are you living a life of significance? Let's talk with today's guest. What was the best piece of advice you've ever been given and and who gave it to you? Uh, The best piece of advice I was ever given would probably be two pieces. One would be don't, especially if I was giving this advice back to my younger self, but, um, it holds true now as well, but don't take time for granted because it passes so quickly. And that's more of a, a kind of a generic one that I've heard many, many people sp- uh, tell me, but my mentors truly have said this, don't take time for granted. You know, it's, it's very, uh, it, it's, it's truly limited and we should cherish it. And then kind of off the side of that, which has been more impactful for me recently in the, in the last year or two is appreciate the small moments. Now I've actually, I just had this conversation with my son too, because it relates to all of us. What happens is we get busy, right? You, maybe mm-hmm. you're busy studying, you're busy with sports or you're busy with work, whatever that is. And, um, we actually set goals. We all either, even subconsciously, like, you know, many of us write out our goals or we have visible our goals, but even if you don't do that, you have things you want to accomplish. Maybe it's making JV or varsity, or maybe it's getting an A on this test. So we all have these kind of goals and human nature is once we get to that goal, like we're constantly chasing that goal. Once we achieve it, we push the goal further. Now it becomes, I want to get an A on every test, or I want to get straight A's, or I want to have to be first string on varsity, or you know, I have to make a certain level of income, or whatever that is. And as human nature, what happens, we push harder and harder and harder. We achieve all these goals, but the goals continue to go forward because we're never satisfied with what we've just accomplished. So stopping and, and recognizing when you achieve those, those moments, those goals, no matter how small they are and turning around and looking back and seeing where you've come and appreciating that journey will make a huge difference as far as happiness and gratification in life. And also later on in life, make a huge difference from, from burning out or overwhelm or stress. Yeah, I actually have a quick story for this and uh, it is it is not by a person. I think I was reading a book and I, I forgot the name of the person who wrote the story. In China, like we do palm reading. And if you uh, take out one of your hands and you will see on your hands, the inside has like different lines, right? Like kind of wrinkles here and there. So the line that is closest to your thumb, and we call that one the life line. So what life line does is it symbolizes longevity, lifespan. So the longer that line is, and I mean, theoretically, the longer your life is supposed to be. But the interesting part is if you are making a fist, 
and you will notice that more than two third of this lifeline is going to be inside your face. So what this tells us is we control our lives, and two third, more than two third of our lifelines are inside our hands, inside the fist, and we control our lives. Don't let other people control your life. And、uh, use yourself. Allow yourself to design your own life. So that story has been with me like forever, especially coming to the U.S. and starting this journey. I love that story. Yeah. He he gave me a piece of advice to never give up, and I still follow it to this day because in whatever we are doing. Even if it seems easy from the outside, or、uh, it might be even something that's very pleasant, like the podcast that I'm doing, I love doing it, and、uh, it's amazing. Like the people that I'm speaking with, and the the people that I'm meeting is is something that was just a dream a few years ago, but it's still challenging at times、uh, because I have other projects going on. Um, I have my own bills, my own expenses, and I have to find a way to balance everything. My my own life with the work that I'm doing, and it can be challenging at times. But not giving up was really something that、uh, that I got for from him. It was something really powerful that I that I didn't forget. Oh, that would have to be my dad. <laughs> I remember.、Um, so, Mark, when when I left my corporate job, I tried to start my own business, like completely from scratch. Had no idea what I was doing. I just learned what entrepreneurship was.、Um, I went off on my own. I struggled, struggled, and hustle, hustled for six months. It didn't work out. I didn't get any clients. I wasn't making any money. I had responsibilities. I had to go back to corporate America. And then I had the opportunity to leave corporate America again, and it was either going to be to try and pick up my business again and give it another go and really try and make that happen, or to join John, my boyfriend、uh, at the time and still and now business partner. So you know which choice I made. <laughs>、um, but that was a really, really, really tough decision. You know, I felt like I was caught between this、um, really like like self doubt stage where. I wanted to prove to myself and to others that I could make it work. It was embarrassing and heartbreaking that I had to go back to corporate America, that I couldn't run my own business,、um, or you know, I, there was so much that I wanted in this other opportunity for John and I to become partners, to pick up on the vision that he had, which I absolutely loved,、um, you know, impacting and inspiring people to become entrepreneurs. I absolutely love that. Um, and so I remember calling my dad up and saying, "Dad, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm definitely quitting my job, but I don't know if I should go it on my own and really like prove to myself that I can make this work, or join John on the team at Entrepreneurs on Fire." And he said, "Kate, follow your gut. Like, whatever decision you make is going to be the right decision because even if it doesn't work out, you're going to learn a lesson from it, and you're going to be able to make a different choice from there." And Like ever since, trusting my gut is like not something that anybody has really ever said to me directly, but it has impacted so much of how I make decisions now. Like if it feels wrong in my gut, I I I don't do it, and it's served me over and over and over again. Possibly one of the most memorable things. Um, that I have listened to, read, watched in the past year or so, is I watched an interview with、um, Oprah Winfrey and J.K. Rowling. And the reason why I'm telling you this is that there, there is something I've adopted from this interview as a little bit of a mantra. It was about J.K. Rowling's story, which is very, very famous about how you know she was you know kind of really, really poor, but had this belief. In、uh, an idea of Harry Potter and how, you know, she's she's the ultimate Cinderella story, isn't she? She's now one of the richest women in the world. But I loved that interview for for lots of different reasons. One because of kind of she was, you know, obviously a very like a you know a spiritual person and you know believes in herself and doing good in the world, which I absolutely love. Um, two, she just talked about this. 
this thing that, where she said, you know, I knew there was something inside of me that that I knew Harry Potter, you know, was going to be, um, you know, so successful, you know. And she said, and I felt it like no other idea that I'd ever had before. And I kind of feel that way about Steam School. And then she talked about uh, the Harry Potter books. And the last line of the last Harry Potter book is all is well. And I just thought that was wonderful. And I think as entrepreneurs, you know, and 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 even educators as well, you know, we're all we're all on a journey and educated. We're recording this in August and I bet there's loads of teachers out there right now who are really, really worried about the, you know, reliving the GCSE results day as they have to do it for their students and A level students every year and that stress and that worry you know that builds up as those days approach and as you know entrepreneurs we can have good days and bad days that stress and anxiety all is you know is always there but actually everything is going to be okay boy that's a interesting one um i think the one that really struck me the most was um and this one's a little difficult to talk about at times um so right after I came out of the closet, my wife and I were going through marriage and family counseling and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, we were we were trying to work through this. And I remember my wife so badly wanting to somehow try to stay together. And I was just like, this isn't going to work. This isn't who I am, even though we you know we've done this. And so we're working with this therapist. And it wasn't going really well for my wife. Um wasn't really working because she was looking for the answer she couldn't get. There was nothing that was going to change who I was. And so it kind of came to the place where she decided it wasn't working for her. And I said, well, do you mind if I continue working with her? And yeah, I guess so. And you know, we won't go into all that because I didn't turn out to be, you know, it really wasn't what she wanted. But anyway, so I started working with the therapist one on one. And I went in at one point in time and I said, you know, there's just something about you, and I'm saying this to the therapist, that makes me feel like you really get me more than the average person does. And she goes, oh, why do you say that? I said, I don't know. You seem to really get this. And she said, well, I rarely admit this, but she goes, I feel like I can do this with you. It's because my husband came out of the closet late in life. And I was really taken aback by that because not because it was like so shocking, but in a way it was shocking. But I'm like, wow, she does really get me. And then she said these words. The thing I most learned about this whole experience. Was I could be angry and unhappy. Until I realized. My husband was angry, and unhappy. Because he couldn't be who he was. And nobody, nobody deserves to live with being angry and unhappy in themselves because they can't be who they are. And that was a very moving moment for me. And again, there's the connection. That was the first time that solidly landed with me. And it's ironic that here we are all of these years down the road. If you really strip back everything I do, making bold moves, living life on your terms, the podcast living life uncloseted it's about nobody having to be angry and happy for being who they are um i would say this is more recent i'm probably when i say recent like in the probably three four or five year range it's and uh, it's basically don't be afraid to fail like don't be afraid, afraid to try and don't be afraid to fail i'm always bit of a perfectionist sometimes you know a lot of people are i think they don't want to they don't want to try something because they're afraid to look bad or they they, they don't if they fail how they're going to go tell their parents or their friends so they don't they don't take that first step and you know i i didn't start my soft my own software stuff for a very long time i i, I pushed off i pushed off I, I delayed delayed but yeah the main message was once i got into it i did have failures and and it was it was a struggle in the beginning because i didn't know what i was doing but then I learned that it happens to everybody. Everybody struggles in the beginning. Everybody fails in the beginning. And failing is not such a 
strong word, but really it's it's part of the learning process. It's how you react after. If you learn from it and you adjust and you try again with a different angle, that's the way to go. If you see failure, like, all right, this is not meant to be, I'm going to stop here, then you're not, you know, you're not learning from your mistakes. And that's what you need to do is you need to try, you need to fail or make mistakes. I don't say failure is kind of strong word. Make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. And the key is to learn from them, man. Because if you don't try, you don't make mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, you don't learn. And it's basically a podcast. I remember hearing this over and over in the entrepreneurial space from different podcasts. And uh, it just kind of resonated with me after a while. After doing it myself, I was like, oh, wow, you're right. Like, you just got to, you got to make a mistake. No one's going to get it right the first time. Um, I, I have to go back to my father on this one because he really, really helped me out with this piece of advice. When I was a teenager, I must have been 17 or 18 at the time, and I had, I had somehow miraculously found myself in a, in a, a friendship. <laughs> right? uh, and so there was a, a girl who lived down the street. Her name was Casey. And Casey and I were inseparable for probably six months Six, it feels like it was so much longer than that, but it was probably six to eight months. Uh, and we were, we would do everything together. And one night we were out late and it wasn't a school night or anything like that. It was a weekend, but it was late, late, late. And so we were out gallivanting and doing whatever until two or three in the morning. And at, it wasn't like we were going to parties and getting in trouble. We were literally like walking around the neighborhood just talking. You know, we, we did we did go like a long way away because we walked for so long. But we were we were just talking. And I I came back and I found my father sitting in the living room. He was just sitting there awake waiting for me. And he asked me where I'd been. And I told him, I told him everything. I told him where I was, what we were doing. I told him how far we went. Um, it just was really open. And he really looked surprised. And the surprise on his face was because I didn't tell the truth that often back then. I was, I was definitely a dishonest person in my teenage years. I would... And I was good at it. I was such a quality liar. <laughs> uh, and so he could tell that I was telling the truth and he was stunned. And he stopped and he said, okay, Jonathan, listen, I'm really irritated with you. And, and I, I was, I mean, I'm just, obviously I'm awake this late. I'm waiting for you. And if you ever do this again, this are going to be the consequences, but because you just told me the truth, I want to acknowledge that and say thank you. And so I want to let this be a warning. Don't do it again. And he went to bed. And that moment has stuck with me through my entire life because I discovered at that point in time, it became very real for me, that it was easier to be honest and it was more, it was more beneficial to be honest, because honesty got me a better result than the best lie I could have told. And that started my path towards transforming away from being a dishonest person into being someone who's almost 100% honest. The, the only dishonesty I have in me now is when I might try and make somebody feel good if if there there's a situation, right? It's a, it's a positive kind of okay, I'm going to say this thing that I may not fully believe because I want to help this person out. Uh, but other than that, I, I tell people the hardest things. I reveal the hardest things. And I find that my life is significantly better because I'm not trying to remember what I said to someone. I can just count on it having been the honest truth. And as long as I remember the truth, I'm good to go. Well, I'll, I'll say there's two things. One was my mom suggesting I write thank you notes because that has come back to me 
in ways I could not even imagine because you're remembered and, and it stands out and people appreciate the time. You mentioned that yourself. The other one is my father. He suggested way, way back, treat every job you do, whether it's your own business or you work for somebody like you own that business. Uh, take the time to do it right the first time. Don't get sloppy. Don't go too fast. Um, and take the time to look at the details. Uh, my father, being an architect, was all about details. And he was always pointing out things in rooms and buildings that most people never see. And I think those three pieces of advice work in any field that you want. But the, the main one was treating your job like you own the business. Because my first job I went into working for a small company and I just acted like it was mine. And it doesn't mean you boss people around. I don't mean that. It means that you have the care for your job and the interest in your job that everything is important. If there's a piece of trash in the hallway where you work, stop and pick it up and throw it away. If the bathrooms are dirty, clean them. Um, and I know that may sound funny to some listeners going, what is he talking about? But if you treat your job even if you're working at a fast food place or restaurant or whatever, like you own the place, you will stand out, you will shine, and you will be offered opportunities that you never imagined. Because I'll tell you something, not only the clients will notice it, but your boss will notice it. And your boss will go, that is somebody that I want to keep around. I'm going to give them more opportunity to strive to be better and to do more with the business. And like the job that I ended up in uh, for 20 plus years, I ended up owning a part of that business. So uh, that's the way I think that my father really helped me. And I always think back. And another one real quickly is a driving coach I had when I started vintage racing. His name is Louis Shevchik. He uh, helped manage my race cars and so forth. He's been a guest on my show. He owns a restoration facility and a race car, vintage race car prep shop. And the first day I was going to go do my first race, I was very nervous. It was raining. I was in a little uh, British car, a Lotus Formula Junior 18 with very tiny little tires. And I was sitting there going, what am I doing? This is crazy. And he said, hey, Mark, just to remind you, the throttle goes both ways. And it's a little metaphor that works for life too that you don't have to have your foot all the way to the floor all the time in fact sometimes it's good to back off a little bit take a breath take a rest look around and then refocus repoint and shoot and then stand on it again um i've used that in a variety of ways with my life because i tend to kind of push myself really hard to sometimes stop step back take a look at what i'm doing evaluate it same with people uh you know stop give them give them a chance give them a rest and then uh, put your foot down into it again to get through the track. So uh, hopefully that was a good answer for that question. Thanks for listening to the Learning on Fire podcast. For more information, please visit educationonfire.com and follow the links from the homepage. This show is sponsored by the National Association for Primary Education. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.